privilege to call you Lord. Hmm. Who are we to call you Lord? But you are our Lord, our God, our wonderful God. So precious, so holy, so worthy of praise, so merciful, long suffering and gracious you are. Thank you for choosing us before we chose you. Thank you for loving us before we loved you. Thank you, Lord, for our salvation. To you and only to you, dearest, wonderful Jesus, only to you belongs the glory. You are God Almighty. Son of Holy God Almighty, the Son of God, holy, true, and righteous. Thank you. And now we welcome you, blessed Holy Spirit. Where would we be without you? Without your help and comfort and power, You've made Jesus more real in our own life. Thank you. Oh, blessed Heavenly Father. What can we say? Thank you. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father. For sending Jesus into the world. Lift your hands and thank him. Just the very fact of his own. Never forget to whom you belong. Just the very fact you belong to him. Let's thank him. Give you praise, Lord. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus. And I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Sing it, I know you know it. How one, how wonderful he is. How marvelous, how wonderful is my sin. Love for me. Thank you. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, as we lift our hands before you, we cry, Holy Lord. I give you praise. Holy, holy. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, as we lift our voice before you as a token of our love. Holy, 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 gracious. 
gracious Father, gracious Father, gracious Father. We are so blessed to be your children. We are so blessed to be your children, gracious Father. As we lift our voice, as we lift our voice before you as a token of our love. Gracious Father, gracious, precious Jesus, precious Jesus, precious Jesus, we're so glad you redeemed us, we're so glad that you've redeemed us, precious Jesus, as we lift our voice, as we lift our voice before you as a token of our love, precious Jesus, precious Jesus, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come and fill our hearts anew, come and fill our hearts anew, as we lift our voice before you. As a token, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence. Touch our hearts anew, I pray, in Jesus' precious name. And we will, we will give you the glory, dear Lord, wonderful Jesus, all the praise, all the honor, all the glory belongs to you. Just before you take your seats, lift your hands for a minute. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, there is something about his name. There is something about Master. You are Master, Savior. Jesus.
I just sense the anointing flowing already. Lord, this is not our service. This is your service. Every eye closed. Every eye closed. He is the Savior of my soul. Is my Jesus. My Jesus, He's the Savior of my He's the Savior of Just forget all about yourself. Something's happening here. His name is Jesus. Jesus. There's power in that name. Jesus. He's the Savior. my left. I wasn't planning any of this right now. I was planning on ministering the Word. But someone to my left has had troubles with your leg very severely. You've had troubles in the last few days especially. The power of God came on you about five minutes ago or so. You began feeling tremendous heat on that leg. I almost stopped. I almost had you seated, all of you. And the Lord said, I'm not done yet. This is his service. That's why I said, Lord, it's not my service. It's your service. Lift your hands to heaven. Somebody else just back there just got a healing. You've had serious troubles with your skin. I rebuke that cancer in the name of Jesus. I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Somebody with lung cancer, I rebuke it. Forget all about yourself right now. Every eye closed, every hands uplifted. Hallelujah. Receive that healing. Ask him, ask him to touch you. He's in this house. That arthritis, I command it to leave. There's a woman with severe arthritis just begin to, to, to do what you are not able to. 
you'll find the pin is leaving. A neck injury, I rebuke it. Somebody named Gary. The doctor told you you need a heart transplant. You feel tremendous heat. You've had troubles with your heart. healing's happening. There's miracles already. I give you praise, Lord. I give you praise. If you want to be a mature Christian today, you have to begin living for the next life in this life. Can I say it again? If you really want to be strong in the, in the Lord, you have to begin living for the next life in this life. So don't wait till you're in heaven. Don't get to heaven and find out how much you missed on earth. It all begins here. Yes, many will stand in the presence of the Lord and will be rejected. I don't want to be one of them. It's a serious matter. Very serious. Why live in this life and then hear the words, depart from me, I don't know you. Why were you born? Why? Did your parents bring you into this world to know them? No, they're going to die. And after they're dead and gone, you're alone. And people think, well, you know, I want to go to heaven to be with my mother. Where is that in the Bible? Oh, I miss my dad. I want to go to heaven. You know what David said? Whom do I have in heaven but you, Lord? So we all want to get to heaven to see our parents. Show it to me in the Bible. Heaven is about Jesus. No, you won't be married to your husband there. Don't you remember? Till death do us part. Yeah, they get all these ideas, you know. I want to be with my husband. I want to be with my husband. He's not your husband. When you die, it's over. There's no marriage. There's no babies. There's no diapers. There. Heaven kills it all. It's over. You won't be married to the same wife or any wife. You'll be like the angels, the Lord said, right? So I had a guy one time, I, I gave an altar call, this fellow came and he was crying so bad, I felt so sorry for him. Now I gave the altar call so they can be saved, you know? So the guy comes down and he's really almost beside himself. I said, come on, snap out of it, what's wrong with you? He, and he went on and on and on about how his grandmother died and he wants to go to heaven now because she's there. I had to rebuke him. I'm sorry, I'm old-fashioned. I'm a Jesus man. I will always be a Jesus man. And it's time to be all of us a Jesus people. So I said, listen, I said, Jesus did not die so you can go see your, your grandmother. What is this? He didn't want Jesus. He just wanted his grandmother. It's, it's all messed up right now. People are messed up a little bit. Their heads are messed up. 
I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I lost my filter. <laughs> I say it like it is. So if you get offended, I don't care. <laughs> I'm not here to please you, you know. I'm, I'm not going to stand before the judgment seat of you. I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I am, believe me, I'm getting ready for that moment, even now. I had an experience in 2015 that really changed my life. And that's why I'm talking like this to you. I was in the hospital almost dead. Almost dead. Congestive heart failure. The doctor said, had I been late one day, I'd be dead. One day. My ejection fraction was down to 14. You nurses, how many of you are nurses here? If it's under 20, you know where the heart pumps, you know? Mine was down to 14, 14. Anything under 20, you're dead. It's, a, it's actually amazing, I survived. They began to, put, to give me all these drugs like LASIK and to pump all the stuff out of me. Two weeks in ICU. And all the people I thought were my friends didn't even bother calling. I'm serious. It's terrible. When you are in need, you know who your friends are. And the ones that called, I didn't expect them to call. The first man to call me was Pat Robertson. And he's been my friend a long time. The second one, Bonky. Reinhard Bonky. Reinhard flew in and sat there with me in the room. True friend. But people who used to come to my crusades, whom I made them known to the world, didn't even call. Not even one of them called. It's okay. Who cares? It's all, it's all about Jesus, not people. But you know, the thing is, you, you wake up to reality you know, when you go through something like that. And then I see these nurses in the hospital who weren't even Christians, some of them. But they knew who I was. One guy, he, you know, he didn't look like normal, you know. He, he had too many tattoos on him. And I don't, you know, oh my. <laughs> had I seen that guy on the street, I would probably cross the street, gone down the way. But he was one of my nurses. And, and he came to take, every day they would come and take blood. And I, I, I got so tired of them putting those needles inside of me. And I said, do you have to do this again? Every few hours, here you come, you know. You, I had holes everywhere in my body. He says, it's time you listen to me now. <laughs> he said, I, I watched you when I was a kid on TV. And you always told us to trust in the Lord. I'm telling you now, have faith. <laughs> That's what he said. He did not even look like a Christian. He looked like somebody who came from some planet. Space, you know? But my goodness, I saw, I saw such love with those people who didn't look right, you know. They showed the... The real love of Jesus came out of these nurses, male nurses and female nurses, and they were crying when I left the hospital. They were rejoicing. It was wonderful. My doctor, who was, I, I guess he was somewhat of a Christian, I'm not sure, to Yansang, he's from the Philippines. He grabs my hand, you know. He starts crying. The guy starts crying. He says, I know who you are, and I will not let you die. And I thought, oh my God, I'm dying. I don't know it was so bad, you know. <laughs> he says, I won't let you die. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so I come out of the hospital, and I have a dream. And this is what changed me. That's why I'm like that now, you know. I have a dream. So real, so vivid, so powerful. I'm standing what seemed to be in heaven, 
with a group of preachers. I didn't know who they were. I didn't see their faces. We were all standing in, a, in this line together, dressed in white robes of all things. And I saw the Lord on, on, on the right side of this most beautiful gate, massive gate sparkling with like, looked like diamonds on it. And then across the way I see a lady I knew, Jeannie Klattenberg, who is in heaven now. She died years ago with cancer in Orlando. Her husband is Alex Klattenberg, who has a big church in Orlando. And she's sitting on this beautiful organ, playing the organ. And she used to play the organ in church all the time. And I see the Lord doing this. And suddenly the gates open. And she played the most beautiful music came out of that organ. And then the second person, the same thing and so on. And then the Lord did this. You know, he didn't say a word. He just, yes or no. And when he did this, two massive individuals, most likely angels, I don't know. They came and took that man out of the line, one man. And when he turned around, I saw his face. The fear, the fear that struck that man was, un I mean, I can still, you know, see it. And then she played, I don't know why, one day I'll find out in heaven, but she played this frightening thing came out of that organ. And then one after another, some yes and some no, but mostly yes, thank God. And then my, my turn came. Am I going to get in or not? And nothing happened. The Lord just didn't do this and didn't do that. And I woke up. And I... I'm, I'm waking up hearing his voice like I'm waking up with an audible voice that says, I'm watching you. Do not blow it. <laughs> well, that's scary. You say, well, how could this be? Look, look, let's be real. Paul the apostle said, if I do not put my body under subjection, I will be a castaway. Read it there in Corinthians. So if Paul the Apostle could be rejected after all that he experienced, who are we? So it's time really to take our faith seriously. This is not a game. This is not about ministry and, and, and you know, popularity and all this. No, no, it's about what the Lord says and thinks. Dear Eddie Long, you know, came to see me one day after all the people saw on the, on the news. That man was scared to death. He wanted to know what I thought. I said, it's not what I think. And I had never met him before, never met him before. I said, it's not me. It's what he thinks. And later on, he had cancer and died. Who cares what your pastor thinks about you or your friends? What does Jesus say about you? That's what will determine, that's what will decide if you are in or out. Yeah, hell is a real place. It's in the Bible. I'll never forget one time in Louisiana, I was preaching at a church. And I'm down the aisle, and I'm asking people, are you born again? Yes. Are you born again? Yes. And one old man, very nasty looking, he said, no. And I do not believe in God. He was so arrogant. And I don't believe in the devil. And I don't believe in heaven, and I do not believe in hell. I said, you will when you get there. <laughs> yeah, it's there. You know, people today deny the existence of God, and yet, read the horoscope. <laughs> They're not all there, are they? They deny the existence of God, but they, they believe in the existence of some supernatural power to tell them their, their future. One 
in four men who read the horoscope daily in this country. One, I think, in two or three women read the horoscope. Like staggering numbers of people in this country read the horoscope. Every magazine you buy in the stores, those gossip magazines, have it in them because people want to read them. And, and Christian men and women today are, in many, many areas, are listening to a weakened message. The gospel is not being preached like I heard it when I got saved. When I got saved in Canada, what, all we heard was the crucified life, the cross, repentance, the blood of Jesus. And we had some of the greatest ministers of the day come to our church called the Catacombs in Canada. Can you believe it? When I was 19 years old, I heard Richard Rombrandt minister the Word of God. His face shone like an angel. He was persecuted in Romania, put in a pit in Siberia. He was a pastor in Romania. Or Derek Prince would come and minister to us. Even Cory Ten Boom came. You all know who Cory Ten Boom was, right? How many don't know who I'm talking about? Okay, go get the movie, The Hiding Place. You'll, you'll, you'll know. I danced with Cory Ten Boom. Can you believe that I was in her house in Holland? Because I was a part of a group called Shekhina. Shekhina, as you say. The Watsons, Mervyn Mola Watson, uh, started that group. She's the lady who wrote Jehovah Jireh. I was in her home when she, when she wrote the song Jehovah Jireh. And they organized a group to go to Europe and minister in all the cathedrals of Europe. And I was one of the kids. And we happened to be in Holland and they knew Corey and we stayed in the uh, homes of YWAM, Youth with a Mission, you know. And it happened to be that Corey's nephew was my roommate, Danilo, his name. And she came one morning looking for Danilo, and I was in the room, and she said, where is Danilo? I said, I don't know, he just left, and she grabbed my cheek, like this. She said, where did you get this face? I said, Israel. She said, Shalom, and walked out. Later, we, we, we went to her house, and we went to the hiding place. We saw the, where, where all that happened with our family, and uh, went to her home. And in the garden, we danced, all the kids and, and her danced together. In the, and I was right next. I grabbed her hand and danced with Cory Ten Boom. So, you know, I've been there quite a while. I'm, I'm probably one of the very few people that attended Catherine Cummins' meetings in those early days. But we really heard the gospel then. Dying to self, carrying your cross, follow the Lord, deny the world, say no to sins and temptations and all that. Beautiful. Now you, all you hear is how to and 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 nobody knows what they're talking about. Because it's not about Jesus anymore. It's about how you can fix it with a list of how to, how to. No, forget it. It's the Bible. So now, after that experience, you can imagine I was shaken up, that dream. And I made a decision. I will not finish weak. I will not finish a failure. I will not be rejected no matter what the price is, no matter what the cost is. And the Lord spoke to me now seven years ago. He said, cancel Netflix, cancel direct, cancel cable. I have not watched TV in seven years. The most wonderful thing I ever did. I'm not asking you to do that, but God told me to do that. So what do I do with my time? Read the Bible, and I love it. But it's not just the Word of God. 
You know, it's spending time in the Lord. It's, you know, doing the things I've always wanted to do anyways as a Christian. But the thing is, and I'm not going to share everything with you. It's not right. But the thing that is, that is my, my, my focus is finish stronger than when you began. Simple. But no matter what the cost is. Now, here's one thing that I have learned, which it's an old lesson, frankly, that the Holy Spirit just will not allow us to forget. So, Isaiah 59, 16, it says, And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him. His righteousness sustained him. Imagine God Almighty looking for someone to pray. To intercede for Israel. Then you look at Isaiah 64, 7. It's an amazing verse when you think about it and look at it. And it says, And there is none that calleth upon thy name. That's what's happening today, sadly. There's none that stirreth up himself. To take hold of thee. Nobody is calling on your name, Lord. Nobody is stirring up himself to take hold of you, Lord. And that's the reason thou has hid thy face from us. Do you know why the Lord, his presence is no longer reality in many people's lives? It's right there. They just don't talk to him anymore. They're not in his word anymore. For thou hast hid your face from us. And as a result, we have been consumed because of our sins. So, yes, I'm talking to you today about the most important part of the Christian life, communion with God, fellowship with the Lord. But what is the fuel behind it? What gives you power to pray, really pray? Let's go to Psalm 119. You will never pray until you do what I'm going to show you in the scriptures. You can listen to a million messages on prayer. It'll do nothing for you. It may, it may you know, cause you to pray a day or two. Or something will cause you to pray when you're scared or afraid. But this is the real fuel, the power behind it. Verse 1, 2, and 3 of Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, that seek him with the whole heart. Isn't that amazing? We have the answer here to the power of prayer. What are they? It says, blessed are those who are not defiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. So secret number one, walk in the law of the Lord, and you can't till you know what it says. You can't walk in the word of God and obey the scriptures unless you know them. And two, blessed are they that keep them. Keep the word in your life. Keep the word alive in you. And then it says, now the result is they will seek him with a whole heart, not half hearts. They will seek the Lord. Why? Because the word is in them. 
Now let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. Look at me, all of you. <laughs> Look, you gotta hear this. You will never receive the word of God properly unless you do it the Bible way. And the Bible way is meditate. You know some one, you all know someone, right? Huh? Yeah. Meditation. Ah, uh, let me make it real simple for you. You have to make a decision, first of all, to really know God's mind. And God's mind is his word. I don't have to meet you to know you if I read your letters sent to me. Or I read your book. Oral Roberts looked at me one day. Now we had known each other for many years. He looks at me one day and he stares at me in his home. Now, you know, I was his neighbor. I, I would see him like at least once a week, maybe sometimes twice a week. He was up in age and my wife and I would cook for him and take him food and this and that. And he was getting old and so was Evelyn. And this is like years after we had known each other physically and we thought we knew each other. And he looks at me and says, now I know you. Hmm? I just read Good Morning Holy Spirit. I had not read your book till this morning. And now I know you. Wow. So all the times we talked to each other, he did not know me. <laughs> but he was saying something powerful. You don't need to meet someone to know them. Just read what they say. God Almighty has sent you a letter. Read it. He has sent you books. Read them. Read them. So when you get in the scriptures, follow the thought that God gives you. Don't, know. Don't start jumping from book to book. You'll never succeed that way. That's just a, uh, something people came up with that doesn't work. From Genesis to Revelation. And you start reading the Word of God slowly, prayerfully. Don't jump around. And you read a thought. Meaning, stop when the thought stops. The thought could be 10 chapters, 4 chapters, 7 chapters, whatever. So when you read like Genesis, read one thought. That's 11 chapters. Why? From chapter 1 to 11, it's the history of men. It's a thought. So, well, I can't do that. Fine. Break it in two. Make it simpler. Fine. And then from 11 right through 24, it's Abraham. Then from 24 to 28, Isaac. From 28 to 32, Jacob. And then his sons. And then Joseph at the end. That's the whole book. But you, you, you don't rush. You take that thought you just read and go over it. And over it. And over it. And then think about it. Meditate like the cow, you know? Choose the cud. Get, the, get all the nourishment out of those beautiful chapters. Slowly. And that word will get in there. Not in your head, in your heart. And the second it gets in your heart, pow! Then I woke you up. What happens? Life. And when that life hits, oh dear Jesus, I'll, you start talking to him. Are you listening? When life hits that heart of yours, you talk to him. And it's not some list you have that is selfish and greedy with your needs only and nobody else's. Now you talk to him. Literally, prayer is born through the scriptures inside of you. Comprende? Good. When that happens, this happens right here. It says, not only will you seek him, but you'll break 
the power of sin in your life. They also do no iniquity. Do you remember? I've hid your word in my heart, not my brain, that I might not sin against you. That's what David wrote. So the Bible is the fuel for the engine of the Christian life. The word of God. When that word of God is in us, ah, prayer is born. Now, is that, is that clear? So you don't have to go listen to sermons on prayer as much as they help. Thank God for that. Or read books on prayer. That's going to help you for a very short time. The word. Only the word will give you that literally life of prayer. And God's word, amazingly, has a pull. It's like a magnet that pulls you in. I've read many books, Christian books. Ah, you read them one time, you're, you're, you're done with it. But the Bible, you're never done with it. I can read a book, some great book from somebody who wrote, I can only read that thing one time, maybe twice if it's really good and that's over. The Word, you go back over the whole life of yours. Reading the Bible over. Why? It's life-giving. It changes you. And now you go back. So I made a decision. I'm going to read my Bible from Genesis to Revelation every four months. One time. That means three times a year. You say, well, I cannot do it. You're Benny Hinn. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. You all can. Get to know the Word. You will not survive the future if you don't. And you'll not make heaven if you don't. Which means all the years you've lived, you've wasted them. You were not born to know your mom and dad or your family. You were born to know the Lord and only the Lord. You came into this world to find him. And now eternity will be secure. Heaven is your home. You are God's precious children. Your eternity is safe in his hands. See, that's very important to us. And how sad that people don't think much about eternity till they're almost dead. D.L. Moody said, if I can take a soul, if I can take a man or a woman for five minutes, keep them quiet for five minutes, and let them think about one thing, their soul, I'll get them saved. Wow, the power of quietness just to think about your soul. People today don't think about anything eternal. They get up in the morning, they go to work, they do the same thing the next day, da, 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 and then they're old and then they're dead. No, that's not, that's not even life. Get to know your God before it's too late. And when you do, you get to know what God says in his word. Ah, prayer now becomes what? It becomes the most spiritual function in your life. Prayer is the most heavenly spiritual function in the life of a Christian. Because that's what the word of God gives you. Fellowship with God. Now listen to this. Please hear this. Say, say after me, Jesus is my life. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Okay, now. His life though, his life is breathed into you according to one thing. Your surrender in prayer. In other words... You can say, Jesus is my life, all you want. But that life of Jesus flows into your being according to the time you spend in prayer. Without prayer, his life is not yours. Meaning, 
When I pray, I inhale his life. When I pray, I exhale my life. Can I say it again? When we pray, we exhale his life. And we, we inhale his life, I should say, and exhale our own life. There's an exchange of lives in prayer. So when I pray, I inhale his life. And I oof, exhale my own life. That's prayer. That's what prayer does. And prayer, oh, I think I'm going to get in trouble now. Prayer is not where people run around and shout or sing, and they tire you out just by looking at them. Prayer means get on your knees. Talk to Jesus. Why, why did Herod kill James? That's a very troubling question. In the book of Acts, Herod the king, a very wicked man, killed the leader of the church in the book of Acts because that was Satan's plan to kill the church before the church could grow. And then they woke up to reality. They said, you know what? We're not going to let you kill Peter. Because he took Peter to prison to kill him. Had the devil succeeded in killing James and Peter then? And possibly John? You would not be sitting here. So that, Satan's plan was, let's kill the apostles. Let's stop the church from even living. He succeeded with only one. And the church said, no, you won't. And what did they do? Pray. And when they prayed, because they had the word in them already, when they prayed, God rescued Peter and killed Herod. See, I would turn on them, on the enemy. Peter was rescued. The church and the life of the church was rescued when those people decided we are going to pray. Not run around and play music and look like a bunch of fools. Pray, real prayer, on your knees. And the church was rescued from Satan's plan. We need to pray again real prayer all right now let me let me just say a few more things when the holy spirit was poured on pentecost why was he poured prayer it says very clearly these all continued to pray in acts 114 they prayed Meaning, meaning that even though the work of redemption complete, it was done, complete. The Holy Spirit promised is not enough. The work of redemption complete, good. The Holy Spirit promised, yes, but they had to pray to see the power of God descend. Even though the work of redemption was complete, the promise given, they had to pray. It says these all continued in prayer. They had to pray. How wonderful to see the Bible uh, giving us such tremendous guidance in this. So, and I'm not going to spend much on this because I've got something to say that I think is very important. All right. Can we go please to Luke 11? Luke 11. Yeah. And we're going to look at verse 5. Because this is really the kind of prayer that is birthed by the Spirit of the Lord. And I want to say something to you here that is really very, very important. Hmm. Can I say something to you before we read this? 
When I, when I opened my Bible, and that really began happening in my life about seven years ago, even though before that I knew the word, read the word, but nothing like the, in the last seven years. I read the word and I'm looking for things I did not uh, seem to uh, be interested in prior. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Pastors, you'll, you'll, you'll love this. The order God gave for the tabernacle is quite puzzling, but revealing, life-changing. Something will burst out of you when you look at it. Ark, table, lampstand, covers, structure. Altar of sacrifice, labor. But the last two, after the garments of the priesthood and much more, the last two will cause you to erupt in prayer if you let God show you. The altar of incense and the labor. And when you see that order, you see the life of Jesus in perfect biblical order. I'm reading it and I'm puzzled. This was years ago when I was puzzled, but I thought, no, I want to know why. Why is that order not exactly as it should be? Because what it should be is ark, table of showbread, incense, then you go out. And then, you know, you just kind of follow the order. But why was the last piece the altar of incense? And then the labor, why? Why were the covers before anything else except the three uh, first pieces of furniture? The life of Jesus, literally with power from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And when you see that fitting such beautifully uh, uh, that order in Philippians. <gasps> I want to know you! You cry out. And then you read portions in Jeremiah and you're just like, like you're, you're, you're amazed. If I find one in Jerusalem, I'll save the city. What kind of God are you? What mercy. And it's just out of just your heart, you start talking to him. I'm amazed by your love. And then you see where God says something to Ezekiel. Oh, Lord, please say that to me. Prayer. It's not born out of a list. Your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters that don't care much for you, whatever. You're, nah, 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 nah. It's born by the scriptures. By what you've read becomes a part of you. And the tears flow. And believe me, you walk out like you think, if I die now, I'm just ready to go. I don't care if the whole place blows up. You, you literally, the, such peace, you don't even want to answer the phone. Such peace, you don't, you don't even want to look at, at things that are worldly. You have to, but you don't want to. It purifies your soul. And now the very appearance of the world is an abhor. You just abhor it. You begin to hate the very things of the flesh. But it's not you. It's not something you've created on your own. There's power in that blessed word of God. So when I talk about prayer, I'm not talking about, you know, praying in tongues and you don't know what you're saying. There's times for that. There's, yes, there's a place for that. Prayer has to do with one thing. Fellowship. Sonship. Relationship. Walking with that mighty God of Israel getting to know him. 
You see the way he is with Moses. You see the way he's grieving with Israel. You see his anger when they built the calf. You see how quickly he changed when Moses says, you can't. <sighs> what a God. His nature begins to literally come your way. Moses said, Lord, I want to know you. I want to see your glory. I'm not interested in your power. I've seen that already. Let me tell you something, people. I have seen enough power in my life to shake your life. I've seen miracles in Catherine Cummins meetings that you haven't seen, but I have. A lady we took. It was wonderful hearing that man's healing. Wonderful. But imagine, my good brother, if you were on a bus for two days with a, a lady who was so crippled with, arth with arthritis, every part of her body was wrapped, twisted like this, like this, that poor, that poor lady. She was hunched over like the hunch of Notre Dame, whatever. I've never seen that movie and I don't have to, I have no, no, no interest. But you saw pictures when I was a kid. You know, like this. That lady was on a wheelchair. She had completely crippled, crippled by arthritis. Wrapped like someone took a, what do you call that thing that the kids play with? Whatever. And Jim Pointer, who was the man who took that bus down to Pittsburgh from Toronto, says to me, and a man named Al Perichon, who ended up working for CBN, became one of the leading men with Pat Robertson. Jim said, you take care of that lady. And we're, we're wheeling her everywhere we would go on that wheelchair. Here she was, all crippled. Her legs crippled, her arms, her little neck like this, nothing. And her husband, a little guy, carrying her purse, following her, that wheelchair. She was quite witty. She said, hey, boys, don't you let them see my wheelchair. You put that wheelchair on the, under the bus and you carry me into that service because she knew that Catherine Kuhlman did not allow wheelchairs on the main floor. They all had to go down the basement. People didn't understand that about her, but that was just the way it is. So we run down the aisle, put her on that row somewhere on the front. Syria Mosque, 1975, Good Friday. And we ran up and sat on the balcony and the balcony came all the way around till the sides of it were over the platform. And we're sitting up there. And now we can see that, that dear lady with her husband down below who was totally wrapped up in crippled. Catherine comes on the platform. And Miss Kuhlman was very dramatic, especially that morning. When Catherine came on the platform, we see that woman. Her body begins to move. God began to stretch her with us looking down. Nobody, nobody laying hands on her. And I went, ah, 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 like this. I, be, I began hitting Jim. So, ah, 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 because I, we were with, with that lady for two days. Stayed in the hotel. Every time we'd stop for some restaurant or restroom, here she was, you know, crippled. She gets out of that chair straight like that. Wait, wait, hold it. Wait, wait, wait. Her body by itself. I've seen miracles. By itself. Nobody laying hands, people screaming all, 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 all over the place when they saw that. And Catherine says, what's this, what's this? And she didn't know what was going on. She gets up straight and the whole bus is going crazy out there. She comes down the aisle straight, perfectly straight, walking for the first time in years. Jean Martin, Brings her up on the platform. She tells Miss Kuhlman what God did for her. And Catherine is about to lay hands on her. I'll never forget that moment. 
And the woman says, just a second, Miss Schoolman. He forgot the finger. The little finger was still twisted a little bit, just, just a little bit. Nobody could even care about that thing. That finger was twisted just a little bit. Nobody even saw the finger. She said, Miss Schoolman, he forgot the finger. And Catherine, in her amazing way, she said, Oh, honey, he left it there that you might remember. I can, I can see that, that moment in my mind. The power of God that Israel saw was way stronger than what I saw in Catherine's meetings. Or my own crusades. And I've seen miracles in our crusades. Dear Lord, have I ever. Power does not change the hearts of men. The Word of God does. <laughs> Satan is not looking for signs and wonders in you. He comes looking for vacancy, you know. It says so in Matthew 12. Comes looks for vacancy because those devils are territorial. See if my old house is still available. I'm going to come and bring more devils with me and make it worse and kill them. What is he looking for? The Word. If you're full of the Word, he has no space. So please, please stop looking for signs and wonders as much as we need them. And get the Word. Because the future is going to be very dangerous. There, there, and there will be demonic signs and wonders that will deceive many. It's about the Bible. Do you know God in his word? Do you know him through the scriptures or through experience? You cannot find him in experience. Israel, think about what they saw 40 years in the wilderness. God speaking with an audible voice. It didn't change them, did it? They saw the glory, the fire by night, the cloud by day. Didn't change them, did it? They wanted to go back to Egypt. God Almighty, Pastor John, brings them out of Egypt with all those mighty wonders. And three days after they leave the land, they say, he brought us out to kill us. They accused God of killing them. When Pharaoh was killing many of them already. And God rescued them from that. You see how the, the human heart is so corrupt. So corrupt. One of these days, the hearts of men on earth will be completely demonic. How many people? How many people have seen Jesus rise from the dead? Nobody. Nobody. But the church believed. How many saw him ascend to heaven? A few. But one of these days, the whole world will see two men rise from the dead. And they will still reject God. You think about what I just said. No one saw Jesus rise from the dead. And yet they believed. They believed. They questioned it at first, but they did believe. And then they saw him ascend. But the whole world will see two men die, killed in Jerusalem, rise from the dead, ascend to heaven. They're going to see, the whole world will see that and still blaspheme God. And still reject, reject him. Why? Because their hearts are wicked. And every day they're getting more and more wicked. So why? The word of God is not in them. The Bible will protect your heart from devils. In the future. Not only now, but in the future. The deception that's coming to the earth today. And what's coming in the future is going to be so demonic you can't even describe it. You can't even explain it. 
God's word will protect you from demonic deception. And preachers who are not preaching the word. Why are so many of them leaving the ministry? There's no Bible. That's why. There's nothing in them. Uh, all right. Which of you having a friend, verse 5, Luke 11, shall go on to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves. A friend of mine is in his journey has come to me. I have nothing to set before him. And he from within will say, Don't trouble me. Then verse 8 is something powerful. Though he will not rise and give him because he's his friend, yet because of his what? Persistence. Persistence is born by the word of the Lord. Persistence in prayer is not born just because you're desperate. Because people will give up eventually anyways when there's no scriptures in them. I have set watchmen, Isaiah 62, 6. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace day or night. Ye who make mention of the, of, the, of the Lord, do not keep silent. Give him no rest. How? The Word. The Word of God is a fire in you. It's not only a hammer, it's a fire in you. The hammer that breaks the old world out of you and the fire of God that comes into you through his scriptures. The Word. I knew enough of the Bible when I was young. You know who John R. Nod is, right? People don't know this, that John and I used to work together. Way back when no, nobody knew our name. Johnny was my assistant. Can you believe that? I knew him before uh, he was married to Carol. I used to babysit for Carol, Pastor John. I was the babysitter for Carol's kids. And dear Johnny, who was a, actually a farmer in Canada when we met, was sitting in, in his car in the early 70s, young, both of us young. He's a little older than me, but not by much. He had the, ah, the smelliest dog I ever, <laughs> ah, and a big German shepherd. And the dog was in the car. The little car he had. And here, he's here, and, he, and I'm there. He's driving, and I'm in the uh, next there. And the dog is right between us. With his tongue stuck out. and <laughs> Breathing heavy and smelling terrible. <laughs> We're at a parking lot in Islington. And John said, let's pray that God will use us one day. We went to the same church. Okay, let's pray. And we, we joined hands with that dog's face right over our hand. <laughs> Lord, we said, word for word, Lord, we will not give you any rest till you use us. And the glory of God hit that car. Dog and all. The glory of God hit that little car on that little parking lot. No rest. The word will cause such persistence in you. Now when that happens, something marvelous is going to happen to you. Are you ready for this? Are you sure? Go to 1 Corinthians 3. Look, look, I'm just being led by the Spirit right now. If, if, if I come and lay hands on you, don't worry about it. But I got to get this through to you. I want you walking in the Spirit. Say, I will. I will. Lift your hands, say, I will. I will. Say, I will walk in the Spirit. In the spirit. And no devil will stop me. No devil will stop me. Nobody will stop me. Now, I'm going I'm to show you what it means to really live in the spirit if you're ready for it. Because in these days, you're going to need it. I said, you're going to need it. 
All right. First Corinthians chapter 3. So it's really a very simple order. Say, look at me and say the word, prayer, life in the spirit. Say it again. A little bit louder. Uh huh. So when you get the word in you, you'll pray automatically. You won't, you won't even have to think. You'll just pray. It's going to come out of you. It'll be so normal like breathing. And then life in the spirit begins. What is it? Uh-huh. Let's go. Now, I want you to read with me. And I want you to, to uh, read out loud. Verse 21, 22, 23 of 1 Corinthians 3. All right? Let's all begin. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Stop, stop. Stay. All things... Are mine. are mine. Say it again. All things are mine. One more time. All things are mine. Now, most people have no clue what this means, but I'm going to explain that to you. Now, let's keep reading out loud. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Say mine. mine. It's all mine. Now read verse 23. And ye are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Now this is an amazing portion. All right. Lift your hands, say, Father. Help me see it. One, one more time. One more time. All right. Now, what this says is, you have no past record. Why? The past is yours. You just read it. Whether present or things to come, it's yours. Meaning, meaning, you are living now, you are walking in a world of no limits. Say no limits. One more time. Say, the past, the, past, the, future, the future, mine. mine. Say it again. The, past, the, future, mine. the world, the world mine. mine. Now that's what it says. It says, let no man glory in men. All things are yours. All things. Whether it's Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world. The world, yours. That's what it says. Or life, or death, or the present, or the future. Now, when I read this, I come up with one headline no limits. Now, don't yawn, young man. You gotta hear this. Somebody yawn over there. Don't 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 do that. No, nobody sleeps in my meeting. Be glad I'm not your pastor. When I was young, my dear Brenda, when, when, when I was young uh, in OCC, if, if somebody slept, I'd look at the cameraman and go, come here. And we'd put the, the camera right on their face and let their face be on the screen. Then I'd take some water and splash them. They wake up. And they all saw it. I said, nobody sleeps at my meetings. All right, so no limits. No, no, wait, wait. It's okay, you already preached. <laughs> <laughs> no limits means no past record. Meaning, I never did drugs. It never happened. I never was divorced. It never happened. I never did and said whatever. It never happened. What? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Everything is passed away. Everything is new. So, so Catherine Kuhlman was divorced. Nearly destroyed her life when she was young. A woman walks up to her one day. Now, what happened, I'll tell you a quick story. She was divorced, left 
she actually married a man who divorced his wife to marry her. Imagine the mess. Now she left him, divorced him, almost ruining her life and ministry. Then she repents, literally on a dead end road. She repents. And the Lord says to her, Catherine, you repented, yes. Then in my books, it never happened. In my books, it never happened. She turned around to never discuss it for the rest of her life. A lady comes up to her, she says, how can you preach? You're a divorced woman. It was bad enough to be a woman preacher back then and a divorced woman preacher, double trouble. You're a divorced woman preacher. Oh, she said, honey, that was somebody else. <laughs> That's what she said. She said, that Catherine died. That Catherine died. She understood no limits. Today, there are Christians who are bound by their past because they have never understood life in the spirit means no limits. No past, no present, no future. All right. Moses stands and there's the Red Sea, huh? Behind them, the Egyptians coming to kill them all. The Israelites cry out. They see the Egyptians and they see the sea and say, oh, we are trapped. But not Moses. Moses did not see the, the, the Egyptians or the sea. He saw God. No limits. And he put a piece of wood out. I mean, think about it in the natural, how silly it is to think you can, with a piece of wood, cause the ocean to split. God says, get up, just stretch that rod. He did not see the army. He did not see the ocean. He saw God and the split happened. David, yea, though I walk in the midst, what? Of the valley of the shadow of death. Boy, that's a terrifying place. I will see no evil. Why? Because I don't see the valley. The Lord is with me. He saw the Lord. That's a life in the spirit. You don't see the valley. You see God. Twelve spies go into the promised land. Ten see giants and two see God. What are you saying? What are you seeing? You see, life, the one I'm talking to you about, will cause you to live in the spirit. And in the spirit means you will not see the natural. You'll not care for the natural. All right. Let's go to Psalm 13. Uh, sorry, Romans 13. I was going to take you to Psalm 23, but maybe just a little bit. I'll do it from now. But Romans 13 is powerful. Life in the spirit. And it's, my message is very, very simple. The word, prayer, life in the spirit. And life in the spirit means no limits. Your past is erased. It never happened and you live it. You're not bound by the things of the present. You're not worried about the things of the future. Life in the spirit. And life in the spirit is so powerful so in Romans 13, 14, it says, put on the Lord Jesus. Put him on. Don't make any provision for the flesh. So when I live in the spirit, I put on the Lord. I starve the flesh. I make no provision for the flesh and its needs because now... I learn to live in the spirit. I have to avoid the places that trigger the flesh. I have the power to say no. Are you people uh, able to go a little deeper? Y y yes or no? Yes. Okay. Let me, let, me, let me get through to you and talk to you. 
What is justification and what is sanctification? Justification is where God declares you righteous, but sanctification is when you grow into that righteousness. Like this, like this, okay. Uh, when a baby is born, the parents claim it, my own baby, but the baby doesn't know them yet. So they say, my boy. He's my baby. I'm going to take care of my baby. They declare him their own, just like God does when we're justified. I declare them mine. They're righteous. But we don't know this God yet. So when a baby is growing up and growing older, oh, mommy, oh, daddy. And then they get to know the mommy and daddy eventually when they're a little older. And then they participate in that family because they're a part of it. That's growing into the family. So sanctification is growing into righteousness. Why? Because when God justifies us, we are free from the penalty of sin. Wait. When he sanctifies us, we, we become free from the power of sin. I think you missed it. When you grow into the family, into the family, the past is forgotten completely and you walk in the health that the family gives you. The knowledge of the family, papa, mama, brothers, sisters, we become a part, we become one and united. Now we make decisions for the family and later we not only make decisions, we are partners with mommy and daddy. We give them our opinions. That's what God wants from us. Concerning my children, commanding me, be a part. I, I want you to participate in the family of God. All things are yours. Come on, take your place. Yes. Jessica, my Jessica, who's married to Michael, when she was a little girl, she was just a baby. And we claimed her, this is our baby. Now she's in her 40s, she actually says, now dad, I don't feel good about that guy. Don't do that, dad. No, that's a bad decision, dad. You know what? I listen to her. Why? She's my family. Same with God. You got it now. That's why Moses said, you can't do it. What, would it. what will the Egyptians say if you kill them all? Show your power, Lord. Show your power that you can put up with them. Don't kill them. If you kill them, the Egyptians will say you could not, you, you could not bring them in. Wow, what power is that? That a man like Moses can, can tell God, you can't do that. That's growing into the family. Are you listening? Yes. We grow into righteousness when we are sanctified and we're free from the power of sin. When, when we got saved, we were free from the penalty. But that's past tense. That should free you from the past. But sanctification frees you from the present. So you don't go back in that old life of yours. Am I getting through to somebody here? And finally, when you stand before Jesus, you'll be free from the presence of sin. Altogether. No more. We grow in the Lord. That's life in the spirit I'm talking about. And what happens is when the part of sin is breaking loose, you don't even pay attention to it. I'm not looking, no, I'm not going to look at that. No, I'm not going to even think about that. Because now you abhor it. You don't, want, you don't even entertain it. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because it's possible to go back. Now listen carefully to me. The power of the world to pull you back, as long as you're in this body, it is stronger than the power of God that pulls you in, which means you have to, you've got to work harder. It's easier to go back than to go forward when you're in this body, because you have two enemies, the devil and you. You see, but I have, to, I have to add one more thing to just balance it out. The more you live in the spirit, 
the lash that power is pulling you back. You're winning by living in the spirit. Eventually, the power of God is stronger by pulling you in. Because now the weight of sin is being let go. Are you listening? So let not sin beset you. Let it, don't, don't let it be a weight over your shoulders. Get the word in you. That's the first step. Let prayer begin to be truly in you. That's the second step. You'll start living in the spirit. And now sanctification starts. The power of sin gets loose off of you. And the pull of the world is weakened and not strengthened. And the closer you get to the Lord's presence, the easier it is to get in. And there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest. The secret is give him the tools to work with. The word, prayer, walk in the spirit. When you do that, you're giving God the tools to pull you right in. And it becomes easier every day and day by day. But if you're living in the flesh, the part of the world is stronger to pull you back. Because you're not giving God the tools he needs. Did you hear that? So, as I close, the Bible never says, yeah, come, come, I need you here. The Bible never says, nothing is impossible to God. Because he'll do it by himself then, huh? Nothing is impossible with God. Because he needs you. To make it happen. God will never do it by himself. No, give him your life to use it. Give him the tools he needs to make you what he planned for you, what he predestined for you. Are you, are you getting this? So You see, if, 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 if it says in the Bible, pastors, nothing is impossible to God, then he does it alone. But it's with God, meaning you have to surrender before God moves. Oral Roberts said one day to me, he said, Benny, the anointing is coming to you or passing by you. You decide. Wow, well, it's a wake or up or moment. And then he said this. He says, God will not do it without you and you cannot do it without him. God will do nothing without you and you cannot do it without him. If you want to make heaven, give him the tools to use. The word, prayer, life in the spirit. So simple. Because they produce each other. When I read the word, I pray. When I read the word and pray, I live in the spirit. And when I do, I'm being pulled in. And the power of sin starts to let go, let go, let go. So I'm being sanctified. Day by day. Lift your hands and thank him. Say, so Father, Father, give me that hunger, that deep hunger for your word. Oh, blessed Holy Spirit, open my eyes. Cause me to see wondrous things out of your word. Oh, Lord God, burn a new fire in me. Inflame my heart. Inflame my soul with fellowship, with your fellowship. Oh, blessed Lord Jesus, bring me to that place. Life in the Spirit will be mine every day every hour every moment thank you lord thank you for your promise and i believe now with all my heart 
you are able to keep me from falling and to present me blameless, faultless before your throne. I give you the praise. Amen. I am so excited to talk to you about what we're doing with the This Is Your Day programs, the Crusades, the programs from OCC. Our tapes were wearing out, and we want to preserve them for our children and grandchildren, so we began to digitize the This Is Your Day programs that many have watched, the great crusades of the past, OCC's programs, conferences, and so much more. And what we are looking at is really amazing. The technology today is remarkable. Let's watch together and see what our staff has been doing. And then I'll talk to you a little more. Watch this. I see a lady with cancer. You have breast cancer. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that cancer in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Uh, someone with diabetes being healed. I rebuke that diabetes in the name of the Lord. And a neck injury is being healed. I rebuke it in Jesus' blessed name. Lord, anoint everyone watching. Did you see the change from the old look to the new look? I mean, it's very evident. It's costing us thousands of dollars to renew all the old programs. So now our children, our grandchildren can be blessed. You know, the anointing still rests amazingly on these services as you see them. So will you stand with me today to help us just digitize everything from way back in the 70s right to the present to make sure everything we have is right and the way it should look. So. I pray the Lord will speak to you, and I'm going to pray with you that the Lord will bless you for whatever gift you give for this. It's a lot of money, but I believe every tape will be done, and we're already doing it, but we need more help from you wonderful partners. The information is on the screen for you. You can go to our website. You can go on the platform you're watching me on, or simply text BHM45777 with your gift. Lord, bless your people, honor them, reward them, prosper them, and use these states for years to come for your glory. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thank you, and I'll see you again tomorrow.